Okay, so it's 12 noon. We'll get started. Uh, welcome everyone to Medical Grand Rounds. We have uh, our speaker today, courtesy of uh, the Division of ID. Before we get started, just a few minor reminders. Uh, please answer a brief questionnaire that will be sent to you at the end of the presentation. This will let us know that you were present today. As well, uh, please leave your questions till the end and enter them in the chat. Uh, so I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Marcel Baer, the Chief of Infectious Disease, to introduce our speaker who's coming to us from that division. Marcel? Uh, thank you, Nadia, and uh, thank you all who are attending. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce Alex Lewandi. Alex uh, is now an Assistant Professor in the Division of Infectious Diseases. He did his undergrad training and medicine training and fellowship in ID and Micro all at McGill University. Prior to that, he had another life as, I think, a, a police crime lab uh, expert, and so uh, you could ask him about that on another day. Uh, after his ID and micro training at McGill University, he went to the NIH, where he did a combined clinical research fellowship. Uh, he was in the ICU, and he brought back a lot of ID expertise from there, and also worked on new proteomic-based methods of studying antimicrobial resistance. He came back to us in August of this year. He's been on the ID consult service. Many of you have may have uh, encountered him. And starting in early 2023, he will also be uh, attending in the ICU. Um, so if you see an ID person in the ICU, his name is Alex Lewandi. Uh, today, he's going to tell us about antibiotic resistance. And more specifically, he's going to be asking whether we're missing the forest for the trees and whether we've been prioritizing lab resistance over clinical outcomes of our patients. Alex, glad to have you speaking and looking forward to the talk. Thank you very much, Marcel. And uh, thank you to the Department of Medicine for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, a special thank to the audience today uh, for joining us. I recognize that at this time of year, you will have competing interests uh, the holidays and family time versus the wards, which are bursting at the seams. So I appreciate that you've come to see me uh, give this talk. So as Marcel said, the title of my talk is Missing the Forest for the Trees, the Prioritization of Resistance Profiles over Patient Outcomes. I'd like to spend the next 40 to 45 minutes or so just reviewing some of the data on antimicrobial resistance and uh, how it's being perceived in North America is asking the question, are we potentially ignoring um, the larger patient population that is suffering from infections because of all of the attention being paid to antimicrobial resistance? So uh, disclosures, uh, I will be presenting some work that was funded in part by the National Institutes of Health. And um, I am still uh, affiliated with them as a research collaborator, as an official capacity. And so I'll just give the boilerplate statement that uh, the opinions I'll be expressing here are strictly my own. They do not represent official positions of the United States federal government, the Department of Health and Human Services, nor the National Institutes of Health. And as I said, you know, this is gonna be a North American centric talk. Uh, a lot of what I'll be discussing may not be applicable to other uh, geographic locations. So some objectives for today, I'd like to view antimicrobial resistance through the different lenses presented in North American Western Europe. And I'd like to examine the burden of bacterial infection globally and in the United States and Canada, and characterize the epidemiology of AMR versus AMS infections here specifically. And then I'd like to discuss reprioritization away from AMR towards AMS pathogens. Uh, by the end of this talk, I don't expect anybody to have a concrete answer as to whether or not we are uh, underfunding antimicrobial susceptible infections, but I'd simply like to raise the questions in your mind as to whether AMR has, uh, the funding of AMR, the attention to AMR has potentially caused uh, an underappreciation of AMS pathogens. Okay, so to begin with, I don't think you need to be a healthcare practitioner to know about antimicrobial resistance. Uh, that has become a somewhat of a buzzword and a hot topic in the past couple of decades, um, in large part because of reports of uh, AMR have uh, 
uh, heightened everybody's awareness in academic centers and uh, government uh, bodies, but also because the mass media has caught on and has uh, started to fulfill its role of warning citizens uh, and the population, the general population of uh, the threat of antimicrobial resistance. And uh, the mass media has done an excellent job of raising that awareness through a series of articles. And it seems every month or two months, you will see an article in some form from the mass media uh, reporting on some of the dire statistics regarding antimicrobial resistance globally. Here's a couple of examples of that. Um, here's one from the UK. The next three will be from the UK. Antibiotic resistance, world on cusp of post-antibiotic era. Uh, from The Guardian in uh, the UK, uh, antibiotic apocalypse, doctors sound alarm over drug resistance. The terrifying prospect that even routine operations will be impossible to perform has been raised by experts, al alarmed by the rise of drug resistant genes. Alarm as superbug hits British hospital. And most recently um, from CNN, uh, drug resistant infections and deaths among hospital patients grew amid COVID-19 pandemic. This was a story that uh, caught on to a CDC report indicating alarming trends in changes in antimicrobial resistance that occurred throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, thought to be in part driven by uh, marked increases in antibiotic consumption in the empiric period um, in the early parts of the pandemic. And so I would argue that public awareness of antimicrobial resistance is gonna be key to its control. Right, because so much of what's driving AMR globally can be seen as overconsumption of antibiotics to a certain extent, um, lapses in infection control policies. And we need the public to be on board with a lot of the measures we're going to put in place to try and limit AMR. We have to kind of reduce the uh, general population's demand for antibiotics when they have simple viral illnesses. We have to encourage hand hygiene in hospital settings, appropriate uh, gowning for people visiting and trying to limit the spread within our hospitals. And so the mass media has a very critical role in informing the population about AMR. But as a rhetorical question, I would ask for you to consider whether buzzwords are necessary for this. Does the term apocalypse belong in a discussion of AMR? Uh, and what are the implications of this hype on the perception of susceptible pathogens? You know, if AMR is the absolute worst thing that can happen to a patient, does that by uh, reflection mean that AMS pathogens are no big deal to the general population? How has the mass media's portrayal of AMR influenced people's perception of susceptible infections? We have to recognize as well that uh, the general population will include policymakers um, and people who make decisions on how tax dollars are applied, how we fund our research on the national and international levels. Um, so I think that is uh, critical to keep in mind. Now, while governments, while the mass media has a role in disseminating information to the public and informing the public of impending health threats, it's easy to argue that uh, that's actually the primary responsibility of the government, of governments worldwide, who have to inform their citizens, their populations about looming health threats. And so uh, governments have been doing a great job for informing the population about the threat of AMR, I think, for a number of years. One of the tools used by government bodies are infographics, uh, which can disseminate uh, important information in easily digestible form uh, for the population to read and be informed with. So here's one from uh, the European CDC released on European Antibiotic Awareness Day, mark your calendars, ladies and gentlemen, um, where they indicate that about 35,000 deaths in Europe are occurring because of AMR. And they have a nice picture that's about the population of a cruise ship. I presume that's what that means. I haven't actually been on a cruise ship. Um, here on the left, we have a graphic representing the health impact of AMR comparing and contrasting it to that of HIV, tuberculosis, and influenza, and seeing that, you know, uh, very well represented that AMR probably represents as much health impact on the European population as HIV, TB, and influenza combined. And lastly, in this middle graphic, we have a misleading graphic stating that over 70% of healthcare associated infections um, are antimicrobial resistant. Uh, in fact, that is a little bit of a mislead because it's actually more that over 70% of AMR infections are occurring in the healthcare uh, environment. Uh, 
and not the other way around. But regardless, I thought this was a very informative graphic for uh, the population to understand, you know, from the government perspective, uh, here are some of the numbers. This is a first view of some of the uh, burden of AMR in Europe. Here's a graphic released by our own government in Canada, um, which states that MRSA infections have increased by 60% since 2012. Um, more than 50% of all gonorrhea infections are now resistant to at least one antibiotic. C. diff, stable, whatever. Uh, but there's been a five-fold increase in uh, carbapenemase um, or carbapenem-resistant uh, bacteria uh, detected within the country. This is between the 2012-2019. Uh, um, that's what these numbers represent. Uh, so here we have some fairly concrete numbers uh, to inform the population of the rising AMR within Canada uh, to help justify some of the expenditures uh, on our end. Lastly, here's one from the United States, uh, which I liked. I mean, the United States must have a remarkable budget for infographics because if you look up AMR infographs in the United States, you can find hundreds of them. But this is one of my favorite. Uh, because it gives concrete numbers, you know, it states that about each year, about almost 3 million infections due to uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria occurring or fungi are occurring in the United States, leading to about 35,000 uh, deaths per year. So finally, we have the most concrete of numbers uh, here coming from the United States uh, CDC. Now, governments have a responsibility to disseminate health information to its citizens. Because uh, governments obviously are responsible for our healthcare infrastructure. They're responsible for funding healthcare research to a great extent. And therefore, to a certain extent, the government has to justify its utilization of resources. I like to know where our tax dollars are going, for instance. Um, and so they have to justify the appropriation of funds and public health measures that are being put in place. Now, whether or not you found it useful having Premier Legault or then President Donald Trump on uh, camera every day during the early pandemic served a purpose, nebulous as that may have been at the time, to inform the and reassure the public and explain what they were actually gonna do. And so these infographics uh, are a way of the government kind of expressing the concern over AMR and why we need to actually invest in uh, combating it. But I would argue that context is king. And again, I would ask you a rhetorical question to ask yourselves, do you feel that the information provided in infographic form to the general population is sufficient to inform the reader of the relative threat of antimicrobial resistance relative to infections in general? So in the healthcare setting, you know, as, as physicians, as you know, PhDs and healthcare workers, um, we can't deal with mass media. We can't just deal with government reports. We need the hard data. So what does the current hard data tell us about the state of AMR globally? In January of this year, the Murray Report was released, what's conventionally known as the Murray Report in AMR circles, um, which was a uh, report on the global surveillance of antimicrobial resistant infections um, in 2019. This is a study that was partially funded by the Gates Foundation um, to study the global burden of bacterial AMR in 2019 with a focus on mortality. So this is a billion dollar study, literally billion dollar study, part of the uh, global burden of disease uh, study infrastructure, which set out to enumerate how many AMR infections are occurring globally, leading to how many associated deaths and how many attributable deaths to give us global level estimates of just how bad the AMR crisis is. This is arguably one of the largest epidemiologic studies ever undertaken. And if you read it, you'll read the appendix, which is about 300 pages where they explain exactly what they did in minute detail, including a lot of the statistical modeling, uh, which was dramatic. But in essence, they took data from uh, well over 100 nations in the form of death certificate data, where they can directly say, according to the death certificate, to what people die of, but as well as hospital discharge summaries, micro lab reports that sometimes were uh, accompanying patient outcomes, sometimes were not. These literature study, global sur um, national surveillance reports, pharmaceutical sales, uh, antibiotic administration data, they used everything that they could conceivably think of 
to try to build estimates for uh, how much AMR there was in the different nations around the world, broken up into what they called uh, GBD super regions, regions of the globe uh, within the Global Burn of Diseases uh, study framework. So what did they find? Here is one of their main findings. This is a graphic representing the death rate per uh, 100,000 population uh, attributable or associated to uh, antimicrobial resistance. And along the x-axis, we have the different uh, um, parts of the different GBD super regions, different parts of the world. And they find something that is not surprising to anybody who knows AMR. On the far left, we have the African nations, uh, which have the highest uh, death rate per 100,000 population associated with antimicrobial resistance or attributable to antimicrobial resistance with absolutely terrifying numbers. 120 deaths per 100,000 population in Western and Sub-Saharan Africa associated with resistance with about 30, 25 to 30 directly attributable to resistance. Um, so we knew way before the study that LMICs uh, in different parts of Africa and different parts of Asia had the highest rates of AMR. This was not striking, but to see it uh, on the global scale as presented by the uh, Murray report was quite uh, quite terrifying uh, in terms of the, the sheer numbers, in terms of those death rates. Now, where are we uh, here in North America? We're on the right side of this graph. Uh, you can see us here, down here, the high income North America, where we have about a, you know, a little less than a third, or excuse me, a little more than a third um, death rate per 100,000 population that's associated to resistance and uh, a little bit less uh, than three quarters that's directly attributable to. So we're in the range of, you know, 70, 70 deaths per 100,000 um, associated and about 25 2025 attributable to uh, resistance. So terrifying numbers. Now I'd ask you again, rhetorical questions, all these questions are rhetorical. Um, if you had to put yourselves on this graph, where would you want to be? Would you want to be in the far left or would you want to be on the far right? And I'm kind of leading you to um, the conclusion that, you know what, maybe you don't have enough information to make that call as to where you would want to be on this graph necessarily. And we'll see why in a moment. Now, the Murray Report also reported the uh, deaths uh, as a function of site of infection. So as you would think as clinicians, well, what's gonna be the infection is gonna kill people. That's pretty easy. It's gonna be your lower respiratory tract infections, your bloodstream infections and your intra-abdominal infections, the big three. I don't expect cellulitis and skin infections to be a major contributor to death in the AMR world, um, so not on the level of pneumonia and bloodstream infections and intra-abdominal infections. And what did they find? Absolutely terrifying numbers again, you know, about 1.7 million deaths, it's a hard, that's a hard count, per year uh, caused by pneumonia that is associated with resistance and almost half a million directly attributable to resistance. Bloodstream infections, again, 1.5 million uh, associated, and very close to you know 400,000 attributable, and the intra-abdominal a little bit less. You're closer to 900,000, 900,000 um, associated, and about uh, 250, 300,000 um, attributable to uh, AMR. Globally, they provided some numbers that was picked up by the media, uh, and has become sort of the a flashpoint for people in the research field, recognize, you know what, this is terrible, right? 1.3 million deaths attributable directly to AMR globally is their estimate. Um, 4.95 directly associated with AMR. Comparison, depending on the study that you look at, COVID-19 is often quoted as being about 6.7 million people dying since the start of the pandemic from COVID-19. This is a single year. This, these numbers are a single year of deaths uh, attributable to antimicrobial resistance. One year, 1.3 million. That's terrible. That's terrifying, right? Now, the majority of these deaths are occurring in areas where novel therapies are limited and standards of care may not represent those in North America. And that is often, when this report came out, that is often what people would say, well, 
you know what, uh, here in North America, our outcomes are not going to be so bad for AMR because we have such a vast armamentarium. Um, we have such excellent modern critical care infrastructure. We have so many, uh, so many resources that, you know, AMR, the outcomes are not that bad. They accept, you know, the, the rates of actual uh, identification of AMR is about that, um, but the outcomes may not be the same. And so there was a question of whether or not we could actually compare outcomes between regions of the, the GBD like that, um, arguing that perhaps in North America, the attributable deaths are not as serious. And you know, it's, a, it's an interesting argument, okay? But uh, how do we get around that? So the easiest way to do that would be say, okay, well, is there a resistance pattern where the armamentarium in a particular period of time in the United States or in North America may not help us, may not save us that much. And that's the difficult to treat resistance phenotype. Most of you are probably familiar with DTR, that concept, but in case you're not, it was a term coined by Samir Kadri and the ARORI, which is the um, Antimicrobial Research Outcomes Research Initiative, Antimicrobial Resistance uh, Outcomes Research Initiative of the NIH in 2018, where they said, you know, let's find the most clinically relevant resistance pattern uh, associated uh, with uh, deaths in the United States, um, where we were really truly treatment limited. We did not have treatment options for. It's defined as non-susceptibility to all beta-lactams of fluoroquinolones, the first line therapies. What anybody on this call would turn to to treat a patient if they present with infection, we just take that off the table. That's what DTR is supposed to represent. Um, and this concept has been taken up by major gram-negative resistance guidelines from the IDSA and ESCMID uh, since because it's been very well accepted. So graphically, what does DTR represent? Um, it represents uh, an intersection between XDR, um, uh, PDR, and MDR. Uh, you can see it here. If you're familiar with MDR, XDR, and PDR, the CDC uh, co-resistance phenotypes, MDR basically means you have to be resistant to at least uh, one of three, at least one agent in at least three antibiotic classes. XDR, you have to have susceptibility to one or two at the most agents, and PDR is resistant to everything. So what do we know about the epidemiology of DTR in the US? And I guess this is the worst case scenario. This is where we say, this is a resistance pattern where our resources may not make that much of a difference, where we don't have the armamentarium for it. The data from 173 hospitals that include patient level and counter level and lab level data, where uh, Kadri et al. identified all bloodstream infections with GNR isolates, and they classified according to the drug resistance profile, DTR, uh, carbapenem resistance, uh, extended cephalosporin resistance, extended spectrum cephalosporin resistance, and fluoroquinolone resistance. And they determined the outcome of those encounters. So what did they find? Well, they found what you would expect, you know, Acinobacter baumannii, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and our good friend Klebsiella pneumoniae are the most commonly encountered organisms displaying DTR, and that's what you would expect. The ease with, with which ABOM and Pseudomonas uh, gain resistant profiles meant that they would be, you know, predominant in Klebsiella because of its virulence, not surprising that it was one of the, um, uh, one of the main pathogens. What did they find for deaths? Shockingly, you know, uh, 37 to 40 percent of Enterobacterialis infections associated with DTR. Um, 30 to 40 percent of those infections uh, led to more death in those patients. But 41 percent for Pseudomonas aeruginosa, 43 percent for Acinobacter baumannii. So the adjusted risk ratio for death was about 1.4 for Enterobacterialis, similarly for Pseudomonas, and about 1.6 for ABOM compared to. Uh, panseptive or antimicrobial susceptible infection. So the unadjusted mortality rates for DTR, the worst case scenario AMR phenotype in the United States with all of its resources when you don't have access to a therapy, 38 to 55%. So again, you know what? That's terrifying, right? And the researchers demonstrated that, you know, as you have fewer drug options, your mortality increased. So DTR compared with uh, carbapenem resistance uh, C3 resistance, fluoroquinolone resistance had a much higher risk of mortality associated with it. As you lost agents, your mortality rate, risk goes way up. 
So, you know, there can be no doubt that antimicrobial resistance impacts and limits therapeutic options. We're not going to be reaching for colistin if we don't have to. And compared to first line uh, therapies, second, third, fourth line often have more toxicities and are less efficacious. So mortality rates of AMR, DTR are significant, all other things being equal. So you can make the argument, well, the GBD numbers suggesting that uh, countries in Africa have the worst outcomes, have such high mortality. It's not because they have AMR, it's because, you know, the difference in standards of care it doesn't really hold water because in our setting, when we have DTR, our mortalities are striking. <clears throat> so the global estimate suggests a staggering burden of AMR and attributable associated deaths. The risk associated with AMR is biologically plausible and evidence in hard data, both globally and North America. You can see the numbers in the Murray report. You can see the numbers in the DTR reports. And so mass media and world governments are appropriately raising the alarm about AMR and in that lens are probably appropriate uh, to spend the money that they are. So what are the government responses towards AMR? Um, the CDC funded by Congress to tune about 360 million US dollars since 2016 for AMR targeting initiatives, $360 million. Uh, NIH and NIAID have funded the ARLG, the Antibiotic Resistance Leadership Group, uh, for 106 million US dollars. This is a, a group of AMR uh, researchers headed by Vance Fowler and Chip Chambers um, who dispersed the money to uh, other initiatives that have a lot of promise to combat AMR. Uh, BARDA, Biomedical Advanced Research Directive, something like that. Uh, I can't remember what that acronym stands for. Um, spends about 300 million US dollars over the last uh, 10 years for the um, Combating Antimicrobial Resistance Biopharmaceutical uh, Accelerator, CARB-X, which is a not-for-profit designed to uh, improve uh, and accelerate antimicrobial discovery um, in the United States, particularly and globally. Finding numbers for the Canadian government response is a little bit more challenging. I see Dow Nguyen online should probably inform us a little bit more. Um, CIHR and the Institute for Infection Immunity have dedicated about 94 million between 2009-2010 and 2013-2014. There's numerous other grants now that are available in, um, in the realm of AMR to help fund research. Government can has pledged about $20 million to the Genomics Research and Development Initiative, excuse me, initiative, and I'm sure there's many more. So the North American investment in antimicrobial resistance is probably well over a billion dollars uh, of hard numbers. So what are your take homes from what I and how I presented this information? So the mass media and governments are raising alarm over AMR. Global and local data support that alarm because the mortality rates are so high. The sheer number of people dying from AMR globally is staggering. So if you look at AMR through this lens, the lens of the data as I presented it, I don't think anybody on this call would actually question whether or not these investments are justified. We're facing terrible outcomes, high burden of mortality. And so we have, a, we have an imperative to actually uh, target these uh, infections. But I would ask you what's missing from the data that I've presented. So I've really only presented numerator data, haven't I? Now, I, I haven't told you anything about the number of deaths associated or attributable to infections in general. So it's hard to understand, you know, AMR's rate rising if we don't know what the baseline rate of infections are doing, right? So we don't know the number of deaths in different sites from the Murray study that are not associated with AMR. Is that a drop in the pool, perhaps? So in other words, where are the numbers for the susceptible infections and their burden? And uh, what does that conspicuous absence in some of this data and some of these infographics actually mean to the general public? So I'd ask again rhetorically, is the absence of concrete discussion of AMS, antimicrobial susceptible infections, leading to the belief it is not serious, not relevant? If we all, all we talk about is AMR, should patients with AMS infections be concerned or not? What is the messaging that about AMS infections that is coming off of uh, all the investment and discussion on AMR? I would argue that the focus on AMR is hiding the burden of AMS infections. If AMR is the trees, AMS is the forest in this analogy. So what can we say about antimicrobial septal infections in our setting? Well, let's take a look at the DTR study from Kadri et al. again. 
So he had data from 173 hospitals. They, so he, they had data from 173 hospitals between 2009 and 2013. They identified 46,521 gram-negative bloodstream infections. Only 1% of those actually had DTR, 471. Only 2.3% had carbapenem resistance. Only 9% had C3 resistance, so cep um, cephalosporin resistance. And only 22% had fluoroquinolone resistance. So that would mean that by any definition, 65.7% of the gram-negative bloodstream infections occurring at these institutions in this time period were susceptible by almost any definition that you use, meaning we could treat them readily. And what happens to these patients with the AMS infections? Well, 15% of the patients in that study died. 43% of patients with DTR died. 35% with carbapenem resistance, 22% with ECR, 18% with fluoroquinolone resistance. In comparison, the mortality rates were only like 6.9% for AMS infections. So less than you know a quarter for the DTR compared to DTR infections. So really much lower mortality rates. But then if you actually think about the sheer number of these infections occurring, you realize, well, wait a second. The number of people who actually died of pan-susceptible gram-negative bloodstream infections was actually much higher than um, those dying from DTR. There's about 47% of patients who died in the study had fully susceptible bacteria. And I see some questions appearing in the chat. I'm going to wait uh, until the end to address those or to read them at least. And we're doing pretty well for time, I think. Okay. So were these outlier hospitals? So was this just, you know, a weird sampling error from 173 hospitals that suggested that, you know what, uh, other parts of the United States have much higher uh, rates of infection, of AMR infection relative to AMS. So the group followed up with a confirmatory study and external validation where they uh, looked at data from 140 different hospitals between 2009 and 2015. Uh, they found 17,386 gram negative bloodstream infections again. And again, 1.5% of these patients had the ETR criteria, only 1%, 1.5% here. Again, mortality is staggering for the patients who had the DTR infections. 65.7% of patients with DTR syndromes died in comparison to only 11.8% of, of patients with fully susceptible enterobacterialis. But again, if you play the numbers game and you realize, well, wait a second, the number of patients who had fully susceptible bacterial infections was much larger than that with DTR or any kind of resistant infection, then realize about 68% of the associated deaths were occurring in patients with susceptible infections. So that means that in the United States, there's 15 times more antimicrobial susceptible infections than there are antimicrobial resistant ones. 15 times more. It accounts for the majority of gram-negative rod bloodstream infections. The majority are AMS. If we include ECR and FQR as simple resistance, things that you know we can treat, 85% uh, of the mortality in gram-negative bloodstream infections is occurring in treatable in, with treatable uh, bacteria, treatable pathogens. 85% of deaths occurring are occurring with, in patients who have infections for which first-line therapy is potentially available. So that's the United States. What about Canada? Um, so finding numbers in Canada is not as easy. Uh, we have a number of surveillance studies. Uh, we have the CanWord study. Um, we have data published by PHAC. Um, but really, those are surveillance studies looking at microbiology only, not outcomes. So when I was putting together this presentation, I said, well, I, I can't let... Uh, this opportunity to go by without plugging uh, Cedric Ansuni and Matthew Cheng's FABLE trial, which a number of you will probably remember. This was a study that they ran uh, across Canada and one center in the United States where they evaluated the effects of antibiotic administration on blood culture yield in patients presenting to ERs with sepsis and septic shock. And this was a very well-received paper um, published in Annals a number of years ago now. They had seven centers in Canada, one in the United States, if my mind uh, remembers correctly. 325 patients were enrolled in the study, 102 bloodstream infections identified, 42 of which had any clinically relevant AMR. I used the loosest definition possible to identify these, any clinically relevant AMR. So 58% were susceptible, 70% of the patients who died, there was a 32% mortality rate, 70% who died had 
uh, antimicrobial susceptible infections. So uh, I would argue that the virulence attributed to resistance hides the danger of antimicrobial susceptibility, okay? I'm gonna pause here and say, this is a photo from uh, The Godfather. If there's anybody on this call who doesn't recognize this cast or recognize this movie, uh, I, I give you permission to log off because you will get more from the rest of your afternoon watching The Godfather than you will from this talk. Uh, and if there's any trainees who are a bit younger who maybe are not familiar with this film, ask your attendings uh, to let you off service. Trust me, it, it'll be a worthwhile educational experience. Now, I like this analogy because if you've seen the film, then you know, uh, when you look at this photo, Michael Corleone, Vito Corleone, and Sonny Corleone are the ones that you don't want to mess with. They're the dangerous ones in the family, in theory. So in this analogy, they represent the antimicrobial resistant infections. Particularly Sonny, you know what you're getting. In comparison, Fredo is probably the antimicrobial susceptible infection. He represents AMS. Uh, because he's a little bit slower, he's a little bit not as you know confrontational. He seems to be a little bit weaker. People look at him, they think, "Oh, it's just Fredo." <laughs> um, but if you've seen the films, you'll know by the end of the films, Fredo's just as dangerous as the other Corleones, and so that's why this is an apt analogy. Because when you actually look at the data and you think about it hard, you will realize that, yeah, you know what, uh, antimicrobial susceptible infections are not innocuous. So let's look at some of these types of infections. Let's start off with methicillin susceptible staphylococcus aureus infections, MSSA. Um, I've been spending so much time talking about GNRs, gram negatives, I thought, well, let's plug a little bit of the gram positive infections. So MSSA accounts for the majority of staphylococcus aureus infections in Canada, okay? And that's about 80 to 90% of staph aureus bloodstream infections are methicillin susceptible infections. Um, and that data comes out of uh, like British Columbia and Alberta. Different provinces have different numbers, but by and large, you know, I, I don't think it would be surprised here. You know, MSA happens for sure, but you're looking about 85% somewhere around that being MSA for bloodstream infections. So what do we know about MSSA? Well, let's look at our own institutional data. Uh, Todd Lee and Matt Cheng uh, ran the DASH trial a number of years ago, and they found that, you know what, uh, in a study looking at adjunctive daptomycin for the treatment of MSSA, um, the mortality rate for all comers, everybody included, was about 18%. Um, so 18% mortality rate at our center. I want you to think about that because how often are you seeing MSA bloodstream infections? One in five of your patients are going to die, potentially. And that's at the MUHC where we have world experts in the management of MSA infections, where we have excellent echocardiographies, excellent uh, cardiac surgeons, all of our resources, we need drugs, we can get them. 18%, one in five patients are dying of MSA. Think about how prevalent that disease is across our country. Well, then maybe you can realize that, you know what, that's, uh, MSA is a lot more dangerous than we would realize. What about group A strep? So we're in the middle of a little outbreak of group A strep. Uh, group A strep is arguably the most susceptible bacteria on the face of the planet. Slowly penicillin susceptible, it's easy to treat. It gets too close to penicillin, it dies. But according to the WHO, there's about 500,000 deaths per year attributable to group A strep. 500,000, just a group A strep, easily treatable disease. That's about a third, a third, over a third actually, of uh, all AMR attributable deaths in 2019, all of them, by one single susceptible pathogen. Some data from Ontario suggests that 15% of patients in Ontario with invasive group A strep disease would die. It's old data, 1996. But I can feel pretty confident saying that our management of group A strep has not dramatically improved uh, since then. So antimicrobial susceptible infections can be deadly just as AMR infections are. But they're far more prevalent than AMR infections in our setting. They're what's maiming and killing our patients. And they don't necessarily benefit from a lot of the antimic novel antimicrobials or AMR research. I don't need to reach for Ceftolose and Tazobactam to treat some of these panseptical infections. I don't think it's going to make a difference. Now, the government of Canada released an interesting infographic um, in one of their, uh, one of their um, studies on AMR, uh, basically saying if we can reverse AMR, 
if we restored activity to first-line antibiotics, about, we could avoid about 40% of deaths from AMR. As said otherwise, that would mean that 60% of the population with these infections, would 60% uh, of the deaths in this population would still occur. So is this a good number? To anybody, when you hear that, are you, oh yeah, that's great. <laughs> we can prevent 40%, oh well, the other 60% is acceptable, that's okay. And does switching to resistance is acceptable always improve the outcomes? It's not clear. So if we take DTR pseudomonas again, these are very difficult to treat uh, pre-novel agents, um, but the availability of agents like cefidericol, uh, Cazavi, Ceftolzin, Tazobactam, Imipenemrelobactam, Miropenem, Vaporobactam, et cetera, uh, basically has restored uh, our ability to treat these with in vitro active agents. Um, usually they were just treated with what's called best available therapies, usually a carbapenem backbone, maybe with aminoglycoside. So if we can truly restore susceptibility uh, to these uh, infections, uh, you would presume that outcome should improve, right? So we conducted a study that's under review now comparing the outcomes of patients who are treated with Kazavians or Baxa to those treated with best available therapy um, from 100 hospitals in the United States. We found about 1,552 patients with a DTR pseudomonas infection in these institutes. But 444 were treated with BAT, 906 with cefalose and tazobactam, and uh, 202 with um, ceftazidimide bactam. We use overlap weight matching to kind of match our cohorts to account for differences in uh, comorbidity. And in this retrospective cohort study, we found that there was no difference in mortality. If they got BAT, uh, non-active agents versus active agents with ceftalose and tazobactam and ceftazidime abubactam. Mortality rate was still about 18 to 20%, and that's diluted a bit by um, patients who probably had uh, positive isolates, but not true infections. So I'm uh, gonna try and wrap up quickly. So um, MSA and group A strep have very high mortalities, and these are very, very common infections. And while we'd like to believe that if we uh, restore activity to some agent, with, if we provide an agent with in vitro activity, we'll improve our outcomes. But I don't know if that's necessarily true. Um, because as we see, you can have a fully susceptible infection and you're not improving your outcomes necessarily. And we have to remember this because what's resistant today may be susceptible tomorrow with all the efforts going towards um, developing novel antimicrobials. And we have to be careful. We don't fall in the trap of saying, oh, you know, now we have this, you know, antibiotic in our back pocket, everything's going to be fine. It's not going to be fine. And those of you who worked in the ICU recently uh, can attest to that um, with some of our group A strep patients and some of the strep anginosis patients that we've recently seen, some of the easy to treat gram negatives. Uh, we still see young people dying. So how can we improve outcomes of antimicrobial susceptible infections if we work within the AMR framework or within the AMR efforts? Is there evidence that new antibiotics will improve outcomes? I'm not so sure. There's a number of new adjunctive therapies that are being uh, developed uh, to treat AMR. These include things like bacteriophage, um, predatory bacteria, sometimes called cannibal uh, bacteria, antimicrobial peptides, um, immunomodulators, vaccines, particularly attractive. Um, some of these may actually hold benefit for antimicrobial susceptible infections, but because our focus is just on AMR, we may not actually know for, for a long period of time whether or not there might be benefit to patients with the larger burden of disease, AMS. So uh, here's a quote from uh, Aaron Sorkin. The first step in solving any problem is recognizing there is one. Uh, I heard this on a TV show a number of years ago, and it stuck with me for whatever reason. I actually like thinking about that way because I've tried to impart the idea that, you know what, when we walk into our hospital today, what's going to kill our patients is antimicrobial susceptible infections. And that billion dollars of investment in North America towards combating AMR is not necessarily going to benefit the vast majority of the people who are going to die of infections in North America. Um, but I've had to use uh, data coming from AMR studies in order to backtrack and say how many AMS infections there are. When you try to actually identify uh, uh, large studies that have like reports on AMS 
infections nationally or internationally, is just, they're just not there. So I think the first step is really trying to figure out what is our burden of antimicrobial susceptible infections, trying to give a number to kind of guide our discussion. Uh, so we're running a study uh, between the MUHC and the NIH um, with collaborators from NIAID, Harvard Medical School, and Emory University uh, and Medical School, aiming to leverage data from about 6,000 hospitals to, to provide national level estimates of the number of infections necessitating admissions, uh, the number of nosocomial infections complicating admissions, burden of AMR versus AMS, and the associated patient and economic outcomes. Obviously, um, when we talk about, you know, as physicians, what we care about most is the mortality outcome. Um, but we want to add in the extra layer of complexity by looking at the actual cost, how much is it directly costing the healthcare system, um, as well as some of the indicators like uh, quality just life years lost, disability just life years, et cetera, some of the softer ones. Um, so connecting the study for the group of uh, universities across the United States, uh, analyzing a staggering number of uh, staggering amount of data, 6,000 hospitals worth um, in order to generate these estimates. And hopefully we'll have some data in the next uh, year or so. So what is our what are our take home points for today? I don't want anybody leaving this talk thinking, oh, Alex does not care about LMICs and the burden of AMR. That's not true. 90% of my research is in AMR are specifically viewing um, how to actually understand and target AMR, okay? Um, and I will argue that, and I don't think anybody on this call would ever argue this, that we have an ethical responsibility on a global scale to utilize our resources to combat threats to human health. And it doesn't matter where that threat is. It doesn't matter if it's here, if it's in Africa, if it's in Asia, or China, it does not matter. We have the resources, we have to apply them appropriately to um, uh, generally help human health, okay? And AMR is undoubtedly one of the threats that requires action. But as I said, you know, when we walk into the hospital today, uh, we have a responsibility to provide the patients at the in our institution with the best care possible and the most advanced care possible. And we have to uh, conduct research and promote um, research that actually will impact them. And I'd say that septal pathogens are contributing more to patient mortality in our setting than AMR ones are. And I don't hear all that much public outcry about MSA. I don't hear all that much about group A strep except in the setting of you know random outbreaks here and there. I don't see the infographics warning about uh, these pathogens. And I think we have to be very careful that the essence of susceptibility testing that we re released in the lab isn't falsely reassuring to patients, physicians, government stakeholders. Because the lens of that AMR is so, so terrible creates kind of a, a doubt in the minds of some people that, you know what, AMS may not be so bad. Uh, it's an infection, we have an antibiotic. And that, that concept potentially would have led to a lot of AMR developing because we overuse antibiotics. We just had such a reliance on them thinking, oh, God's gift, you know? Um, that, that's led to us being where we are now. So these are some of the academic references uh, from today's talk. Uh, some of the, info, the some of the graphics, the, the other ones like the the Godfather picture I didn't include, but I can provide to you um, if you want. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much uh, for spending the last uh, forty eight minutes with me discussing this topic, uh, and I'm open to uh, hearing some of the uh, discussion. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Lewandi, congratulations, really fantastic lecture, uh, really you know, wonderful topic, very informative, and thanks for putting everything into perspective. And, uh, really a wonderful addition to our team uh, in ID and Department of Medicine, so welcome back. Really Thank great you very much. Um, there are a few questions and comments. Uh, I'm going to go through them, and you can feel free to enter your questions, those of you who haven't yet. Um, Putting into perspective in terms of cost, healthcare utilization and costs, a quick question about how does this compare? Because there's a lot of money going towards AMR. How does this compare to other things such as oncology drug development? So that's such a great question, uh, Dr. McDonald. Um, one of the issues that we have in North America is that we have excellent stewardship efforts to a certain extent. And so what that means is that when a drug comes to market uh, in the United States and in Canada, uh, it's restricted to being given to the patients who need it. 
And we define the patients uh, who need it as those with AMR, antimicrobial resistant infections for cephtericol, for rapacycline, um, what have you. And so that means that the market share for um, patients with antimicrobial resistant infections in the wealthy countries who can afford it is tiny. And so uh, the result is that the actual, um, where we need people to be investing and buying the drugs, they won't be doing it because AMR just is not sufficiently prevalent. And so companies um, will not develop the drugs because they simply can't market it in the wealthy nations that easily. You pair that to oncology where, you know what, everybody gets cancer and it's a non-issue. So uh, I don't have the hard numbers, but no, um, the market for uh, oncologic therapies is much larger than that for AMR in North America. And therefore, uh, I would argue that uh, the money spent on oncology therapy is vastly, vastly outweighs um, that for antimicrobials. And that's, that's a logic that's been espoused by Brad Spellberg. I can't take credit for that uh, necessarily. Great question, though. Thank you for that. Um, do you think that death due to AMR is, in many comparisons, confounded by the comorbidities and healthcare exposure, which is associated with AMR? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's a great uh, point, Todd. Um, and so a number of studies, and all of these are done retrospectively using EHR, which I presented, um, rely on uh, a number of different adjustment methods trying to account for that. There's a difference in comorbidities, difference in healthcare exposures. In our own study, we use overlap weight, uh, weighting, trying to come up with or try to balance that. But yeah, for sure, um, a lot of it is confounding, um, certainly, um, by the sicker population getting the DTR pathogens. Dr. Rosenblatt asks, uh, Rosenblatt asks, is this not apples and oranges? Are we comparing present dangers to potential problems of dangers in the future? Are there comparisons to climate change arguments? Tough question there. <sighs> Um, that's an interesting question. I guess I'm not sure. Um, so I guess if I'm understanding correctly, you're arguing then that we're investing because we assume that AMR will come to our shores, uh, and that our patient population will eventually suffer from AMR, AMR and that's that's totally fair. Um, but right now, I'm paid by RIMQ, paid by tax dollars. My research is funded by them, um, and I'm faced with patients right now. Uh, you know. 20 years down the line, I have no idea what's going to happen, but planning for that is not helping me treat the patients today. Um, but yes, I mean, there is a certain amount of futurism that was dictating how we're acting. We're assuming that AMR is going to come to our shores, and that's just evolution, right? We're always going to see AMR. It doesn't matter what we do today. In 50 years, we'll be sitting right back here discussing this still further. We'll have more pathogens, more drug resistance, less options. Um, but right now, as we stand in this moment, um, th this is the clear and present danger to our patients. And what I'd argue is that that it gets lost sometimes in the discussion. Fantastic. Um, Marcel asks, is the bacteria sensitive to antibiotics in the lab, but the patient die? Should we call this antibiotic susceptible infection? Or what term do we propose to use for an infection that does not respond to antibiotic therapy? So that is a brilliant point, Marcel. That is a brilliant point. And what I argue is that that is an AMR infection, right? Because by definition, it is an infection that's persisting in the face of antimicrobials. It is resistant. And we make arguments to ourselves, oh, you know, there's not, there's insufficient source control. Oh, we didn't give the antibiotics long enough to work. But no, I, when we say it's AMS, it stops us from looking further into what those actual isolates look at look like. We don't uh, study them in depth enough in the in the lab to try and understand why they're persisting oftentimes. Staph aureus is an exception, maybe, um, in terms of, you know, it's proclivity to persist in blood to go to other sites. Um, but part of my own research program looks at adaptive resistance, where the lab will release a port that says susceptible, but upon exposure to antimicrobials, it becomes resistant, but then becomes susceptible again when those antimicrobials are, are lost. Um, there's a form of resistance, adaptive resistance, which you can't detect, but is probably um, in part playing a, a role in uh, these drug resistant infections, in the persistence of these infections. So I would argue that the lab report may be not as important as the clinical, um, the clinical question, you know, is this patient responding to therapy? Yes, no. 
are they not responding therapy? Is this drug infection in that lens? Uh, thanks for that. Uh, Luis Pilot is asking about uh, data. You know, we've done lots of data from the US. Do we have anything from the MUHC? And I would add to that, are you planning on collecting anything from the MUHC? Yeah, so uh, I don't have any data from the MUHC other than the FABLE trial and the DASH study. Uh, Todd Lee and Matching are, of course, running the SNAP trial and Peter Penn, which may give us some data uh, in terms of that. Um, I've actually looked at collecting national level data uh, through a CHR um, uh, data network um, being run by Finley McAllister. Uh, I think it's Finland and Callister, um, but I don't have that data yet. In Canada, it becomes very much challenging because of um, rules and regulations regarding data sharing. At the MHC, I don't have specific data uh, in mind. We have, I see Shalfanet has his hand up. Shalfanet, you want to comment on that? Yeah, we, we actually have pretty good data for KPCs, VRE, and MRSA, including mortality for all those infection. Uh, VRE and MRSA is more nosocomial, but we have overall CPE data. Just to give you an example, I think in the last five years at the VIC, we've had seven KPC infection uh, with two deaths at 30 days. So uh, it's something we are following. <laughs> and very pretty, I mean, CP, KPC was our topic last week at the Infection Control Committee, uh, but we do have quite a bit of data. Yeah. And it's actually quite a bit good data in Quebec because all nosocomial infections are, are surveyed, including bacteremias. So you have data then, Charles, that actually uh, has the outcome for non-resistant infections as well for the comparison? Yes, right. yes absolutely. Right. Uh, I, I, while I have the mic, I think one of the important, I mean, I agree completely with Todd that I think mortality is not may not be the right outcome to assess the impact of resistance. But there's been quite a few studies looking at case control studies, you know, comparing and sensitive versus VRE uh, bacteremias and comparing mortality, same for MSSA and MRSA uh, and match as well as you can match them, but it's always difficult to match because ultimately people like, like Todd said, who are heavily uh, hospital exposed are not the same that people walk in from the community. But there are, there are relatively a large number of, you know, fairly well-designed case control studies look, trying to assess specifically the impact of resistance by itself um, versus all the other factors that lead to mortality. Yeah, I'm, those, are, those are great points, uh, Charles. Yeah, there's certainly... Um, there isn't sufficient study and investigation into the role of different virulence factors not associated with resistance and uh, what role they play in patient outcomes that certainly um, benefit from further um, investigation. We're running low on time. I don't know if we can do this in the, in the, in the two minutes that are left, but uh, just a quick question from Dow, Dow Nguyen. Uh, AMS are clearly very important in their mortality and morbidity. However, is this necessarily a zero-sum game? Do the current investments in AR, AMR really take away from needs of AMS? They're certainly very small uh, compared to other research investments, e.g. cancer. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, a great, that's a great point, Dow. Um, this is a drop in the bucket of uh, total research funding. Um, I would never suggest that we should take away from AMR, um, but that uh, the messaging, the focus on AMR, all the initiatives uh, has changed our perspective in the sense that we maybe underestimate AMS and that leads to an underfunding. Um, Certainly, you know, I don't think that we've seen sufficient press really to like group A strep deaths um, or MSSA uh, in comparison to like MRSA to actually reinforce, you know, when your patient has these bloodstream infections that they're going to, they have a chance of dying. And I haven't seen sufficient um, efforts going into actually publicize that, and actually fund those, but it's not a zero sum game. I would never take away from that billion that's going towards AMR because, you know, 1.3 million people are dying every year from AMR. But at the same time, I think we need to actually publicize the data. We need to actually report to the public that, you know, there, there could be a 
order of magnitude more people dying globally from susceptible infections. And I think that that's, that's the issue because that would change how we allocate resources, not necessarily away from AMR, but towards AMS. Yeah, and I think uh, Cedric's last comment is really uh, looking at this, uh, you know, this is, we have, uh, we're really out of time, but basically last comment, how do you propose is the best way to accurately convey the urgency of containing AMR without distracting from the poor outcomes we still have with sepsis? I mean, it's, it's tough. It's tough, Cedric, because you want to balance uh, being informative without causing panic. And infections are so common that if we don't message things properly, uh, either people will think that, you know, we're crying wolf or, you know, you get a, a paronychia, you're in the ER for like <laughs> panicking because you, your patient might think they're going to die. Um, I think that we need to actually have more data looking at patient outcomes and reported that to the government level not just looking at how many antimicrobial resistant infections are leading to death in Canada, how many infections are leading to death in Canada to inform the decision at the government level for how we should allocate funds. And the government of Canada should be able to release reports how many bloodstream infections from MSA occurred or group A strep or susceptible E. coli that's associated with death. And I think that's gonna be key at the government level. I think at the patient level and the general population level, I think that we should have infographics um, accurately demonstrating that as well. Um, because certainly, you know, in the past week when I was on service, um, it was not, it, it occurred at least once that somebody said, oh, well, they have, they have antibiotics, so they'll be fine, um, which is not true. And I think we need to remove that, you know, especially for our younger patients who think that, oh, they'll be fine with their infections. So uh, public infographics, I think, are going to be key. Uh, but uh, the most important thing is going to be actually collecting uh, data at the national level to provide that to uh, government bodies to actually help in um, alerting the public through those uh, mechanisms that I talked about at the start of the talk. Perfect, thank you so much. We're gonna end there, it's, it's past one o'clock. Thank you, Dr. Lewandi, for your really fantastic lecture, obviously generated a lot of conversation. Thank you for everyone who participated in the discussion and thank you for ID to ID for bringing uh, Dr. Lewandi to us today. Thank you for everyone who participated. Have a wonderful afternoon. Everyone, thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Alex.